Hey Rovers, in this video, well, we're not going to do very much boat building. In fact, we're not doing any boat building at all. We are going to focus instead on Wave Rover's sail design, which I had termed the most controversial video yet. And the reason I'm calling it that is because there are so many opinions out there. Some of you have shared them with me already on what really a junk, uh, junk sail should look like and should act like. Well, I'm going to tell you about the choices I've made and the reasons behind them. And then in the second part of the video, there is an opportunity out there for someone who wants to make the trip across from North America to the Azores this summer. I'm calling it the Joshua Challenge, and we have a couple other boats that'll be making that trip with me. And there is a boat that will be available. I'll tell you more about that in the second half of the video. Well, let's crack on and head into Wave Rover University and talk about sail design. Do, 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 do. Hey Rovers, welcome to Wave Rover University. Your regular professor couldn't be here, so you've got this guy who's going to try his best to explain about junk sales and the design that I've gone with out of the different possibilities. Okay, so I know a lot of you have very strong opinions when it comes to sale that there's one right version and nothing else. Well, uh, I don't really feel that way about anything really in life. I think there are many, many possibilities, but let's get stuck right in. There are two main types of junk sales. We have our flat cut sails, which have been around for, oh, I don't know, about 2,000 years. And then more lately, we've gone with cambered sails. So let's take a look at what a cambered sail is. Well, if we could be above the mast and look down, this is the bow and the stern and the top of the mast, the cambered sail would look something like this. There would be a batten that would be running along this uh, line right here that's parallel to the boat and then this curved line would be the sail. Now if we were standing at the stern and looking forward this is what the sail would look like. The little blue dots right here, here, here and here those would be the battens or the boom or the yard you know something that was rigid and then the sail would billow out but it would likely billow out in the center or somewhere in this area to create a foil. It would be tight at the beginning and the end of the sail, or let's say the luff and the leech of the sail. Okay, now this really demands that the load of the sail is being carried in compression all along the batten. So the batten has to be really quite rigid. So that's why you typically would see a carbon fiber tube or an aluminum tube, something that isn't going to give, and if it's the right size and dimensions, it's not going to collapse under the load. So in theory, this is how a cambered sail works. Now, in reality, it's a whole lot more complex to try to get this efficient shape. And it, it, you know, it takes a certain amount of experimenting and a certain amount of tweaking in order to get that. Now, when you get this right, you should have a sail that will perform better in light airs and including to windward than you would have with a flat cut sail. But when the wind gets up a little bit, say to about 10 knots, then both sails will be performing about the same. Perhaps the flat cut sail will be doing better at that point. So let's take a look at what flat sails are, what differentiates them from the cambered sails. And I might as well say it right now, I'll be taking a flat cut sail on the circumnavigation. So what is a flat cut sail and why am I going this route? Okay, so here's our flat cut sail in light airs. You can see it's a, just a straight line. We're looking down, of course, on the mast. And then if we were at the stern looking forward, this is what it would look like. The battens would be running fore and aft, and then the sailcloth would be 
just stretched in between them. And, but when we get say seven knots plus of wind, then what we have is a sail that takes a, a nice shape and we get good drive from that. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible that you have a flat cut sail and then it looks like this? Well, it all comes down to the battens. Now let's head out to the shop and I'll show you what I mean. Now, in order to get that flexibility that we need in a flat cut sail, we need the battens to be able to take a shape. So in this case, this is one of the battens that I'll be putting in the sail. There'll be six in total. And I, I had to put a scarf joint right here because I could only get eight foot lengths. Now, I'll just show you how much flexibility is in this. So we, I'm putting a fair bit of effort into that to bend it this far. And, uh, you know, I can just feel from experience that there is no stress being felt in this wood. So it's because of that. Now this is ash, as I said, and ash, one of the main characteristics of ash wood is that it can take terrific bends and not break. It's one of its characteristics. So it's a terrific wood in that sense, but it's not the only one. Um, if you go into practical junk rig, they will give a list of different woods that would work in the same, uh, you know, to get the same characteristics. So. That's how we get sail shape with a flat cut sail. <clears throat> so I believe I've answered the what is a flat cut sail and how does it work. Now, why am I going with it? Well, the reason I'm going with it, I might have to just back up a tiny bit here. It's because the whole Wave Rover 650, that's, that's my baby. You know, it's been my baby since inception. I've been thinking about this for years. I've uh, been trying to simplify these ideas and make them work. And when I had a nice clear picture in my head, that's when I started the partnership with Andy Dyes, who's the Naval Architect. Now, Andy was able to take all those parameters that I came up with, <clears throat> and he was able to draw up a hull shape that met the, you know, I, I said, I, I don't want it any longer than 6.5 meters. I, I want the sail area to be pretty small. I want it to be light. He took all that on board and came up with just an absolutely marvelous hull shape. And the other things that maybe aren't really obvious to people looking at the channel, especially when they uh, mention, why don't you go with more exotic materials or um, why don't you uh, try this particular technique? What you're not seeing is the other dimension that we had laid out as part of the rover philosophy was that this boat had to be easy to build by your average backyard builder of limited financial means. This whole concept, apart from, you know, the seamanship side of a boat and the design side of the boat, this project was meant to empower the backyard builder into building what is a small, rigorous craft that will be able to sail on any ocean and you'd be hard pressed to come across another craft you could build for the same amount of dollars it'll take to build Wave Rover. And yet, I believe I will be as comfortable on this 21 foot boat as I would be on a 20, on a 32, 36 foot boat without the added maintenance or responsibility and headaches that come with such a large boat. Not to mention the financial burden that a larger boat like that uh, brings on an owner. And I'm talking 30 to 36 feet and I'm calling that large. And yet the average boat today that's crossing the ocean is really somewhere in the 40 to 45 foot range. I mean, I, it just boggles my mind the uh, colossal budget you would need to be able to operate one of those. So that's part of the reason, or that's some of the reasoning behind the Rover philosophy of keeping things small and strong, but yet simple and robust. And of course, it has to be 
a boat that is attainable by somebody of limited means. You shouldn't have to bankrupt yourself to have an adventure on a small boat on the high seas. So that brings us to the sail. How does that weave together? Well, the junk sail is probably as simple as it gets when it comes to both sailing it and building it. Now, I could build this sail myself. In fact, I designed the sail that we're using on Wave Rover. I designed it how? By, by reading this book. It's a practical junk rig. Now, of course, you know, this book has been out for decades. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a paid endorsement, but this is what most of us consider the Bible on junk rigs. And by reading this book, it gave me all the information I needed to design my own sale. Yeah, it, it took, it took about 10 days of back and forth of drawing, of redrawing, uh, making calculations. I did it all longhand, just on graph paper with a ruler and a pencil and a calculator. Now, as I said, at this point, I could make that sale myself. And in the past, Mrs. Rover and I have built a lot of sales for my previous boats. But this time around, we have the services of Dave from Superior Sailmakers in Ontario, Canada, and Superior in the sense that um, he's adjacent to Lake Superior. Uh, it's one of the five great lakes in Canada. And Dave, uh, Dave came to me and said, uh, I'd like to take on this project. And I'm delighted. I'm delighted because this project I'm doing, it's, uh, it's big enough to share more than just one area. I, I'll share as much of the, of the building as I possibly can because I'm on a really, really tight schedule to get this boat launched. So I'm happy with that, with that help. And so Dave, uh, well, I'll let Dave, we'll, we'll switch now to Dave's sail loft and you can see what he's up to. All right, so we've basically got the sails all been plotted and cut. There's three main sections of the sail the parallelogram, and then the two upper triangles. Each section is, is uh, three smaller sections with seams. And what we'll do next is we'll just get the double-sided tape. We'll tape the seams and run them through the sewing machine. Do two rows of four point zigzag on each of the seams, vertical seams. So it's basically four extra inches around the, the whole body of the sail because this will, I'm not sure if it's a camera, but this will turn over uh, to create an extra bit of reinforcement on the leech of the sail and then along the, t the top where the yard and the foot, and don't mind my mess, we've got lots of repairs come in. And it's just a disaster. We'll get that cleaned up tomorrow and we'll have at it. But so the, the upper uh, edge, that'll be on the yard, and the lower edge along the foot will be a double turnover. That'll get a nice bit of bulk for the grommets to grab. Then we'll cut some reinforcement from patches for the corners, the clue corner and the tack corner. And along the luff and the top corner as well. Yeah, that's about it. Some nice cloth. There's our batten positions. I don't know if the camera will pick that up. But the lines here will be our batten positions. They'll terminate four inches from the luff and four inches from the leech. Get some extra reinforcing in there. Yeah, it's, it's a nice cloth. It's, it's a great color. I think it's going to look great.
So this summer I'll be starting the circumnavigation and I'll be leaving from Prince Edward Island where I live and I'll be traversing the North Atlantic. Now the North Atlantic is known at that time of the year in these latitudes of having westerlies. And then I'll be dealing with some light winds as I get from the westerlies down to where the trade winds really start, which is south of the Canary Islands. So I have to go through that range of variable winds to get there. But once I get there, I will be in the trade winds and I will be in the trade winds for the majority of the circumnavigation, pretty much from south of the Canaries right around to pretty much the Indian Ocean. And then, so, I mean, that's what this boat is designed for. It's, it's really designed to optimize those ocean conditions with the junk sail and the way the hull is designed. I, I, should, I should really be optimized really for that, for that circumnavigation. Now, I guess like so many other voyagers, I'm already thinking of my next voyage after this. Even though this voyage is most likely going to take a couple of years, I'm thinking I would really like to do a nice extended voyage through Europe, you know, the British Isles, Northern Europe, and of course the Mediterranean. When I go to do that, I'm all, I've already started talking to Dave, the sailmaker, about building a cambered sail for that because there's a region where I'm going to have a lot of light and variable winds. And that's where a cambered sail might just excel over what I have. So uh, I've asked Dave to do the research into what will be needed in sail shape to, to accomplish that. Um, you know, we're, we're not changing the square footage of the sail. We're not changing the yard or the boom. We're just changing really what would be the battens and the shape of the sail. So a second sail. Uh, now, if you have expertise in this area and you would like to share that with Dave, please do, do so. He's a great guy. He'd, uh, he'd love to get, uh, to get your expertise. And I'll put a link to Dave's sail making business in the channel, in the video description. Now you've had, in a nutshell, what kind of sail I'll be getting for Wave Rover, why I've, I've done that, and a nice little smattering of Wave Rover philosophy. So this is part two of the video, and, and in part two, we're going to be looking at the sailing vessel Nemo. Now let's get the backstory on the sailing vessel Nemo. Nemo is the brainchild of Tom Waite, who's a very, very experienced skipper who has skippered uh, ocean, large ocean racers right down to Contessas and CNC 25s. And Nemo is a CNC 25 that Tom has had professionally outfitted to be really an ultimate solo ocean sailing boat. Now, I'll just uh, say that I have no interests in Nemo whatsoever, neither property-wise nor financial. I'm helping Tom out here, but I'm doing it for a reason, because Tom, after the sale of Nemo, wants to be the very first to build a kit version of the Wave Rover 650. So we, we can produce a kit, but we need to test that as a prototype to make sure everything goes together well, and if it doesn't, fix it so that the prototype can then become, you know, something that we'd be proud of to let anybody build. So let's take a look at what Nemo really looks like. Well, a little over two years ago, Tom purchased a used Mark I CNC 25 and then began an extensive refit. He started by eliminating large side ports and glassing in two small opening ports. He eliminated the sliding companionway hatch and replaced it with a low fiberglass deflection shape. Uh, he strengthened the drop board structure to accommodate three quarter inch solid boards for drop boards. Uh, he decked over the large cockpit, leaving only a small footwell. And uh, that, that really strengthened the after deck, very similar to what I'm doing on Wave Rover. 
The inboard gas engine was removed and the shaftway and strut assemblies were all uh, professionally um, sealed off. The rudder has been replaced with a new modern high performance design built by Ruddercraft. A more significant custom built stainless steel rudder head assembly and tiller were matched to the new rudder. A custom traveler was fabricated and repositioned forward of the transom for ease of control of the main sheets. Um, all controls are led aft to the cockpit with five new self-tailing winches. All standing and running rigging is new in 2021. All sails are new in 1921-22 and they include a fully battened main with three reefs and a Tides Marine track system. The 130% jib is attached to a hark and roll or furling system. The electrical system is centered around a custom marine system design which includes two 150 watt non-skid walk-on solar panels permanently mounted on the aft deck and two 150 amp lithium iron batteries. And again, just like Wave Rover, she has a Victron controller with a smart meter and she has USB ports that are hardwired in below decks. All the lighting below deck is LED, and uh, there's, a, there's an autopilot, which is a pelagic nine axis roll pitch and yaw tiller pilot. Uh, very, very good. It draws very little, and it's extremely accurate. And the running lights uh, are side mounted and stern mounted. They're mil spec, good for 10,000 hours, and absolutely waterproof because they're built into a solid bullet of aluminum uh, casing. The boat was professionally painted with two coats of sprayed Allcraft over two coats of primer. It's bright orange, which is a great color for, you know, a single hander. It's, it's high visibility. And then there was an aggressive coat of light gray Kiwi grip non-skid applied to all horizontal surfaces. So if you're interested in finding out more about Nemo, contact the broker directly and I'll have a link to that broker in the video description. And I'm really eager, as is Tom, and I think a lot of you, that the kit version of Wave Rover proceeds. Now, next week, it's back to building Wave Rover. I have a lot to do. Time to crack on. I'd like to take a moment to honor the Wave Rover benefactors. So what is a benefactor? Well, these folks have made a contribution of $100 US or more to the project, and their names will be affixed to a bulkhead inside Wave Rover and will be traveling with me on our circumnavigation. Now, these donations truly are much appreciated. Well, the Wave Rover patrons, with their pledges of support, really do make the creation of these videos possible. Now, if you'd like to know more about Wave Rover's patron page and Benefactors Bulkhead, I have links to both those pages in the video description. Now, another way to help Wave Rover, and it doesn't cost you a dime, is by sharing our content on your social media. So now, as always, Rovers, thanks for watching. Give us one more. <laughs>